glad to be here, everybody. I uh, I just flew in from Colorado about an hour ago, so I was worried I wouldn't make it here, but I did. So very good. And I broke no bones skiing in Telluride. So glad to be here. And uh, we have about 21 people here. And yeah, thank you, Danny. So today we're going to talk about IP, intellectual property. And remember, this is something we covered in the six weeks in, uh, in detail in another course. So I'm going to cover kind of the main points here, but obviously not everything. And I will also um, cover some things we, we left off last. So last time, let's, uh, let's go and get into it because every class I think I'm going to finish in 60 minutes and we go almost um, 90 minutes. Um, so where we left off, we were talking about causation, aggression, and responsibility. And we talked about um, uh, how you can be liable for inciting a crime um, and then also limitations on property versus limitations on action and why the fact that you can't commit aggression doesn't mean that rights are limited. It means that your actions uh, are limited, uh, not property rights. We also talked about strict liability, okay? and we're going to continue a little bit of that here. So today we'll talk um, about strict liability, and then we'll get into IP. So I'll just kind of uh, finish off where we left off on the strict liability issues. Um, so the concept of strict liability is one of these things, it's a term that's thrown around a lot by uh, theorists and non-lawyers and uh, just libertarians sort of casually, almost like the word fraud, which we talked about last time. Um, and people don't really give it a lot of thought. Now, if you remember from our talk about causation and responsibility, you have to distinguish between behavior and action. Okay, so behavior would be something mechanical that you're not responsible for, like an epileptic fit, or if you know if someone picks up your arm and throws it at uh, or strikes someone else in the face with it, you didn't do it. They used your arm to do it, but you didn't do it. Um, so we have to distinguish between mere behavior and and intentional action. And this is actually why there's a spectrum from like um, first degree murder and other crimes and down to mere torts, which are just negligence and things like this, all the way down to no responsibility whatsoever. So the idea of strict liability is that you should be responsible, for example, for your property. So, um, and this is usually, usually used in tort law. So if you sell a product that causes damage to the user, even if you weren't negligent, okay, see, under the old law, you would have to show that the manufacturer of the product was somehow negligent in, um, in, in making the product. Um, but under strict liability, they don't have to show li uh, negligence. They just have to show causation. Okay. Now, I think this is a nebulous idea. It's sort of uh, uh, unlibertarian and not really grounded in libertarian principles. Uh, if you think about it, the general idea is that we should be responsible for our actions. If you want to attribute responsibility to a person for something he didn't directly do, you have to have a good reason for it. So that's called vicarious responsibility or vi vicarious liability. And one example of that is respondeat superior, which I have uh, listed at the bottom of the page here. Let me turn on the… Uh, my pointer. Uh, so responding as superior is one type of vicarious liability. What that means is I'm responsible for, for the wrongs that someone else commits. In this case, the wrongs of my employee. So if I have an employee and he commits a negligent action in the course of his performing his duties for, for my company, then, I, then the co corporation or the company that employs him is responsible for his liability. He's responsible too. So the victim can sue him and they can sue his employer under responding as superior. Now, whether that is um, libertarian or not is debatable because this idea of responding at superior is just taken for granted. Um, some libertarians like Rothbard um, have, some, have some hesitations about whether this is libertarian. Uh, after all, usually you're not ordering the employee to commit a tort. You're telling him drive carefully, etc. So if you have a driver who um, um, you know, runs over someone and hurts them, why am I responsible for that? I mean, you have to have a good reason for that. If I didn't order him to do it or cause him to do it, and in fact, if you think about it, let's suppose he, uh, he's driving the uh, FedEx driver, takes his truck home for, for lunch and has lunch with his wife, and on the way home, he, 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 he hits someone. Now, why would that be FedEx's responsibility? In fact, in the law, that's called going off on a frolic, F-R-O-L-I-C, a frolic. It's like basically something unrelated to his job. But even if it's related to his job, He's not uh, told to be negligent, so you have to have a good reason to attribute responsibility. Otherwise, you, we would have um, results like um, uh, we have now where the tobacco manufacturers are sued for the um, 
uh, for the damages that occur to smokers, even though they voluntarily smoke. Or if someone is killed with a gun, then the gun manufacturer is sued for that. Or all they did was sell someone a gun, and a gun can be used for good or evil purposes. And as long as they didn't intend it to be used for a good purpose, I'm sorry, an evil purpose, and they weren't conspiring with someone, like in a bank robbery, it's not clear why they should be responsible. Um, also consider this, and this goes back to what I talked about last time about um, how we're re you're responsible for your actions, and there are limitations on your actions. Other people's rights impose limitations on your actions, so not on your property. So for example, you can't say property rights are limited because you can't use your, your knife to stab someone. Well, the problem with that formulation is you can't use anyone's knife to stab someone. Um, you know, uh, without provocation. I mean, without provocation, um, it has it does, has nothing to do with whether you own the knife or not. It has to do with whether you use some causally efficacious means to achieve an illicit end. Right? That's the structure of human action. So the means is it could be a gun or a knife or your fist or hiring a hitman. Whatever means you employ to achieve this end, that is what's prohibited. Uh, so it's not a limitation on ownership rights. It's a limitation on what you can do with any means whatsoever, whether you own the, the means or whether you don't own the means. So, for example, let's go to this example I have right here in the middle of the page. Uh, you know, if someone steals your knife and then they use that to commit a crime, are you responsible for that? Now, under an extreme strict liability theory, you would be because you own the knife. But we have to keep clear in mind that ownership is the right to control, the right to control. It doesn't mean necessarily the responsibility to control it or to con prevent it from being stolen even. I mean, sometimes crimes happen. So if you keep in mind that uh, property right is a right to control but doesn't necessarily imply any obligations, um, that will sort of get you out of this conundrum of, where people say, well, you know, your knife was used to kill someone or your dog bit someone or your child hit someone. Um, uh, uh, you know, or you had a heart, or, or you have an epileptic fit, and your arm slapped someone unintentionally, which is mere behavior. Um, it's not clear that that's an action that you should be responsible for. So the general point is, you're responsible for intentional action, regardless of the ownership status of the means that you employ, regardless of whether the means is another person or not. Okay, and if you want to, if if you want to hold someone liable or responsible for the actions of another person, you have to have a good reason for it. Now, in the causality lecture last time. As I pointed out, I think there is a good reason in the case of a conspiracy um, or a joint crime, you know, where you're cooperating to commit a crime. In that case, you, you use means, which is your fellow co-conspirators and whatever other means you employ, to achieve a criminal end. So that's the structure of human action applied to show why that would count as giving me responsibility for the crimes committed by my fellow bank robbers in the course of the robbery. That makes perfect sense. But other cases, you have to have a good reason for it. Okay, Alexis, does it matter what means I use to secure the knife? Could it be negligent if I don't secure it properly? Well, I think it could be in some cases, but that's highly fact-specific fact, uh, and contextual. I mean, this is one of these cases where, in my view, it's hard to answer from your armchair. But we can't say in general that you're always responsible for what happens with your knife. I mean, look, if, if that was the case, if someone stole my knife, even if I was as careful as could be, um, um, I would just abandon the knife. I'd say, look, I get rid of my ownership of it so I don't have any responsibility for it. But that's just a stupid formality. It doesn't make any sense why you would have to do that. Um, Matt says it can be in some cases. Well, I do know, for example, that there's um, a, an analogous situation um, where you um, – um, if you – see, like take the case of promissory notes, which are checks and uh, uh, negotiable instruments, we call these in, in the law. Normally, if you don't sign the check, then you're not responsible for the check okay? Um, because you actually didn't sign it. So if someone forges your signature, then you're not on the hook for the, for, the, um, for the check. But if you leave the check out in a negligent way, like there's a bunch of strangers milling around your house, you leave the checks out. In some cases, I think the law in some jurisdictions says that you should be responsible because you're more negligent than the bank who couldn't tell whether your signature was forged or not. Okay. Now, I don't want to go too far on this because I want to get to IP um, uh, in about five or ten minutes at the most. But let me just say on this case, 
in, in different jurisdictions, there's this thing called the duty risk analysis, w which is how the, the, the positive legal system analyzes negligence. So what they say is, um, did you have a duty that you breached by some negligent action, right, where the risk of what was going to happen or what did happen was contemplated within the scope of your duty? It's this kind of complicated legal test. So what they would do in the handgun case is they would say, well, if you own something dangerous and it's around children and it's on your property and you have the you have the right to control it, then you have the responsibility to use it prudently. So you have a duty to not leave it in full in view, full view of a three-year-old kid, something like that, where he might accidentally shoot someone. Um, so it would be it would be encompassed under that. And I think that a libertarian system, if it was being developed, could draw on some of those ideas, but they would have to look at them really closely and make sure that they are fully compatible with um, libertarian uh, principles. Uh, Okay, Julie, one thing which I don't understand is this. If I plan with three friends to rob a bank and one, one of us guys gets nervous and kills someone, why should I be in any way responsible for his killing? Well, I think the law here is correct, and this is my, my view, and I think most libertarians, uh, theorists, would agree with this. Um, uh, the law is correct in this case, and the reasoning is this. Uh, if you have to choose between the victim and one of the three bank robbers, who would you side with? I mean this is the basic libertarian point. We side with victims. We oppose aggression. And in this case, I would say that the um, you know you are the one who, who helped to initiate this crime, which had the danger and the possibility of, of harm being um, occasioned to innocent um, innocent people. So you are much more responsible for it than the than the victim is. And, uh, and so basically they're all attributed with the responsibility of what all their co-conspirators commit, and I think that's a perfectly libertarian rule. Well, not only did you know there's a possibility, you helped to cause the possibility to arise, and you basically put fellow uh, – you enabled and assisted, right, aided and abetted fellow dangerous criminal people to get into a position where they might do this. So. Um, it's more. I think it's more than negligent. It's actually during the commission of an intentional crime. Um, um, Julie, and you're different people, but again, I, I would I would just think about this. Collective action is possible. Joint action is possible. Cooperative action is possible, and that's what you guys are doing. You are cooperating in the commission of a violent felony, which could well lead to. Um, uh, a serious, you know, death to an innocent person, and you are enabling that to happen. You're helping it to happen, and you are on the side of the the bad guys there. Well, it, it might give some incentives, Julian, but I mean, I think we have to be careful about basing what the right libertarian. Um, policy and rules should be based upon incentives. That can be sort of a way to think about it, but we have to be careful about that. I mean, sometimes justice is justice, and if uh, uh, if someone is a co-conspirator of a bank robbery and someone is murdered during it, I mean, it's hard to imagine many libertarian jurors feeling sorry for this guy. Um, um, and there's a related doctrine called transferred intent. So in transferred intent, uh, let's say you have a, what's called a specific intent crime where – like manslaughter is not specific intent, or maybe second-degree murder is not specific intent. But for the really most severe crimes like first-degree murder, it has to be premeditated, and specific intent means you have to specifically intend to kill that person in a certain way, and then you do it. Um, but there's sort of an exception to that doctrine called transferred intent, and you might want to Google that on Wikipedia. It's kind of an interesting doctrine, which I'm not too opposed to as libertarian. And what it says is, let's say you are uh, shooting at person A. You're aiming at person A, and you want to kill them, but you miss, and the bullet strikes person B standing right behind them. Well, the law will sometimes make an exception and say, well, we're, we're going to transfer your intent from killing A to killing B, and we're going to call that first degree – premeditated specific intent murder of B, even though you really didn't in actual reality specifically intend to kill B, because it's really irrelevant whether you wanted to kill A or B. So we take out that distinction as being an irrelevant distinction. Okay, page uh, – slide five. Good. Okay, before we go to IP, and what I want to do is I think I'll talk about 35 or 40 minutes, and hopefully we will finish 
the main lecture at 9, and then we can have questions. Um, and I've said that every lecture, so I may be um, uh, unintentionally lying, so I apologize. But I will try to finish in 45 minutes. But before we go to IP, does anyone have any questions to date about anything we've discussed or before we get to IP? Um, I'd be happy to take it now for a couple of minutes. Otherwise, I'll go on to IP. Okay. Uh, audio and video quality, um, we have had no freeze-ups yet so far for 22 minutes, so that's pretty good. It's a record. Maybe Dim Dim is uh, improving. <laughs> I don't believe in bad luck, so sorry. I'll knock on my computer. Um, all right. What is IP? Now, let me just explain briefly. Okay, hands are off. Hands are off. Sorry. There's a gremlin in there, a homunculus. All right, I'm back now. <laughs> Still don't believe it. As I, as my son would say, it's just a coincidence. Okay, so what I was saying was um, this topic is important because it sort of illustrates a what I think has been a big mistake made in libertarian uh, thinking for a long time. And it's finally coming to a head, in part with the rise of the internet, etc. Oh, Julian, the joke was that I, I said uh, we haven't had a freeze yet. It's, just, it's been 20 minutes, and Jock said, don't, don't say that. You're going to jinx it. And I said, I don't believe in bad luck. And then it happened. So uh, I guess, uh, I, guess uh, I was proven wrong. Anyway, um, so just to remind you guys, I'm a patent attorney, and I've been doing it for about 18 years. And I've been a libertarian for 25, 30 years, something like that. And what happened was I kind of believed IP was valid because I read Ayn Rand and other people. And it's called intellectual property, and you're strongly in favor of property and the Western American capitalist system. So you sort of assume that IP is valid, and then you read people like Ayn Rand, which are supposed to be arch um, uh, property rights advocates, and they're really in favor of it. So, But… It never made a lot of sense to me. In law school, it always puzzled me because her, her, her argument for IP is full of holes. I mean she pretends to be a principled, deontological type um, um, libertarian, but her arguments for IP are full of sort of uh, utilitarian concerns. For example, uh, patents last 17 or so years. Copyright lasts, I don't know, 50, 70 years, and she was in favor of something like that. I mean she was in favor of it not being zero, not being infinity. Well… I mean, regular property lasts forever, so it's already something different about that. And um, and then even if it's not going to last forever, where you draw the line, like how do you pick – is a patent going to be 15 years, 17, 2 years, 21 years? How do you know what the right number is? So she obviously had no cute clue, so it bothered me. So um, I started practicing patent law in 93, and about that year I finally came to the conclusion simultaneously that uh, – yeah, you know, this is nonsense, and and I'll I'll go through my reasons why, and I, I've believed that ever since, and I've um, honed my reasons over the last several years, and a lot of libertarians are coming this way too now. But this is not my argument, and it's not a new argument. And I mean, there was actually a whole debate about this in the late 1800s, um, and there were early libertarians like Benjamin Tucker and others who were against it, and then there were sort of fairly recent libertarians like a generation ago, like Wendy McElroy, uh, Tom Palmer, and Murray Rothbard even, um, who, who noticed some problems with IP, but you know they gave it some attention, but then it kind of faded away, um, in part because the battle has been lost and IP is entrenched, and in part because um, it, it just wasn't that big of an issue. It was, a, it was bad, but it wasn't like, like the war on drugs or taxes or war uh, or public education, gov government education, etc., uh, but I think what's happened is with the advent of the internet and with the increasing speed of commerce and worldwide communication, um, there are a lot more uh, outrageous patent lawsuits and copyright su suits. They are more frequent. They are they are applied to ever more uh, areas because of the ability of digital information uh, for people to be infringers more easily. You know, with uh, pirating software and uh, music and Cop, you know, file sharing and copying and all this, and the cases where it does happen are transmitted around the world instantly by you know uh, blogs and RSS feeds and uh, on the internet. So people are aware of these things. So it's become more of a hot button issue with everyone really, and libertarians 
in, in my impression, the more principled, more radical, more Austrian type uh, libertarians are almost universally against IP now and with really good arguments. Okay. Yeah, it was funny. Um, so this is why this topic is important. I started writing on it because I practiced patent law and I, I, I saw some ineptness in some of the arguments because people just didn't understand the law. Um, and I was just trying to gather my thoughts on it. And to be honest, this topic never was and still not my most uh, interesting topic to me. I like the other things we've talked about so far better. But this one is so important to talk about, it's become increasingly important. And um, um, and I can um, uh, uh, talk about it because I know something about IP. And I've, I've seen that it, it actually supplements and increases our understanding of different areas of Austrian economics and other areas of property rights itself. So it's an important topic. Uh, as for Jock, your comment about Tucker, yeah, I agree. The, of course, the problem in my view with Tucker, one of his four great monopolies was also land. Now, to an, to an extent, I think he had a point to the, to the extent he was talking about the systems of property rights that had been created by, this, by state privilege, but it wasn't clear that it was that. Um, 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 that was his only only criticism. It was sort of an anti-property or anti-land rights focus. And also, I recently discovered, by the way, I posted on this recently, um, Proudhon, the uh, famous, uh, I guess, left anarchist, left libertarian, darling of the left libertarians, um, who the guy who said property is theft, who, and who also said property is wonderful. Uh, Proudhon actually was in favor of state-granted patents and copyrights, as long as they weren't um, uh, no, it's great. I posted I posted on this on Facebook the other day. I don't know if I did it on, on my blog, but I think it's on the c4sif.org blog. Um, just go there and search for Proudhon, and uh, it's, it's it's it was incredible to me. I mean, um, yes, Jock, I do agree. This is what's really good about a lot of the left, uh, especially the modern left libertarians, but even the old left, um, they were quite good on IP, except for some exceptions like uh, Spooner. Now, I I don't know if I'd call him a lefty, but Spooner was completely crankish on IP. I mean, uh, kind of like Rand or Galambos or someone. Um, and by the way, the greatest cranks on IP, in my view, are Rand, um, Galambos, and uh, maybe Spooner, but I don't give him too much grief because he, he was so early. Uh, Rand should have known better. Uh, Galambos should have known better, I guess, but he was an engineer and infected with a scientific uh, mentality. Okay, so let's talk about what this is. Um, I'm just going to give a quick overview of what IP is. Intellectual property is the term we use now to discover to 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 um, to include a group of state-granted rights. Uh, they didn't used to be called property rights. They used to be called monopoly or whatever they were. So it includes four main types of legal rights uh, and some other more recent ones, but they're not that important. But the main ones are patent, copyright. <coughs> excuse me, trademark and trade secret. And you'll notice that people who talk about IP, like libertarians, uh, especially those who are in favor of it, often don't know what they're talking about. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll mix up cat and copyright. Now, I don't blame them for mixing it up. Um, it's a highly specialized field. It's, I mean, you know, most people don't know a lot about brain surgery either. Um, but they don't have a, big, a lot of opinions on the best brain surgery technique. But for some reason, laymen feel compelled to weigh in on why we need to have patent, copyright, trademark, and trade secret, and when they don't even know really the difference between them, and then they can't explain why we don't have to have fashion designs, or maybe we should have them, or uh, database rights, or moral rights, and um, etc. So the main types of IP is patent and copyright, trademark and trade secret. And then there are other things that are not traditionally called IP, which I think should be con included in IP. That would include things like um, um, Reputation rights, which uh, uh, which is sometimes called defamation or or, or libel or slander, uh, it's very similar to IP. Uh, also, publicity rights. Um, I think there's a recent controversy about whether uh, J.R.R. Tolkien can be a character in a novel, and his estate suing for the right to publicity, which is of course uh, censorship and absurd. Um, and now there are modern rights too of IP rights, like um, boat hull designs, which is sort of a subset of copyright. Um, and um, semiconductor mask work protection, which covers the way you lay out an integrated circuit like in what Intel does. Um, 
And there, there are different types of patents. There is a, so patents cover the main two I'm going to focus on here is patent and copyright. These are the two worst, in my opinion, the two most egregious. Now, I think it's helpful to go back and think about. Um, okay, this is a this this slide here six is just a listing of the different types of of rights. And by the way, fashion rights are being proposed as we speak right now. Uh, they're being fought, but who knows? Um, it's important to understand how these things came about and why uh, – I think it helps to get your mind wrapped around this, that there's been this mistake made all along by libertarians, for example, and why we, we would have done that. <clears throat> so let's just start chronologically. Let's go back in history and think what happened. Um, so the origins of copyright and patent, and let me just briefly say, copyright is a monopoly right granted by the state in the expression of an idea, the way it's expressed. So that would include like a novel or a painting uh, or, or a, a song or lyrics to a song or even software nowadays, and a patent covers an invention, which is a practically useful – Design of a, of, a, of a machine, for example, that does something useful, or of a, a, a series of steps, a process to make something useful, which you could think of as a recipe. Okay, so the origins of things – now, these, these things actually were, were hundreds of years even before their kind of modern origin in, in England in the 15, 1600s, um, back in the, the uh, mercantilist times and even before that, but sort of the – kind of a modern origins of this was in in England and Europe. So here's what happened with copyright. Queen Mary created the Stationers Company in 1557, and she gave them exclusive rights on, over book publishing. And the purpose was to control thought and to censor thought and to prevent the wrong ideas from being published. So they were afraid of the printing press. Uh, the church and the state were afraid of the printing press and the power of ideas. So when the charter for this um, this uh, this guild or this company expired 150 or so years later, they the publishers said, "Hey, we kind of like having the monopoly of this," and they asked Parliament for a statute. And instead of giving it to the to the publishers, they gave it to the authors. So they gave the authors this copyright. So its origins lie in censorship. But one reason that the authors were in favor of it was because they were glad to, that they had the right to decide to release their work. In other words, it released the power of the stationer's company or the state to control their work. They had the power. So in a way, the reason they wanted copyright was they were now free of state censorship. It was up to them. It wasn't this modern mentality that, hey, I've got this copyright. I can now go around extorting people. They were primarily glad that they were able to release lease 